Hello, everyone. Welcome to Chat Channel. My name is Tim Hayden, and I'll be your host. We have a great show for you today. Our guest is the multi-talented, award-winning Raphael Sparge. Raphael is an award-winning actor, producer, writer, and director. He's perhaps best known for his roles as Jake Straka on The Guardian, or Jiminy Cricket, Dr. Archibald Hopper on Once Upon a Time, and Inspector David Mulk on the TNT series Murder in the First. His film credits include Risky Business, Babes in Toyland, Independence Day, Message in a Bottle, Pearl Harbor, and more. Some of his directing and producing include On Begley Street, Jenna Studio, The Bird Who Could Fly, L.A. Foodways, and his current one called Current Two, called Only in Theaters and and Watts. He is also going to be starring in the upcoming sequel movie, The Exorcist. Please welcome Raphael to the show. Hi, Raphael. How are you? I'm good, Tim. Thanks for thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm a huge fan of yours. I follow. I mean, I was I knew you've been in a lot of stuff, but during my research, I would say 75, at least 75 percent of things that you have been in have been my favorite shows. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I mean, the Guardian. I love the Guardian. You and Wendy and all. I mean, that was such a great series. I love that one a lot. Yeah, we were really proud that we we loved doing that show and. Um, all of us were proud of it and felt like it sort of spoke to important issues. And, and Dabney Coleman is an incredible actor and, oh, of course, and, you know, it was, it was a, we, we had a, it was, yeah, uh, we were very happy doing that show. Well, who knows? Maybe in Wendy paths across again, because you did 1883, which is by uh, Taylor, Tyler. And then she's doing, uh, oh gosh, Yellowstone. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. That's gosh. right. That's right. Yeah, Tyler Sheridan. So maybe I was paths across in the Sheridan land of you. That universe. would be great. God, that would make me happy. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I would love to see y'all together. Y'all did great together. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I will start way back in the beginning. What was it like for you growing up in New York? As a what kid? was it like? Um, you know, it's it, <laughs> it was I know a, you were raised in theater as well. Yeah, my, my my mother was a Broadway costume designer and a professor at Yale and at NYU, and and I grew up. My dad was a playwright. They both met at Yale, and and I grew up, uh, you know, literally in a theater. I mean, playing backstage, um, hanging out. My mother would have me age costumes, which is like if you had like, you know, costumes that needed to look old, we would throw mud at it, and you know, I would run around and play with the buttons and the thread, and and I um, I loved it. It was sort of like being, you know, growing up in the circus and 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 the actors were always so sweet to me. And um, and I did my first play at seven and then uh, then started doing more plays when she was a professor at Yale. Um, again, with a lot of fancy people were there, Meryl Streep and Sigourney Weaver and Wendy Wasserstein wow. and were all, and Chris Durang were all playwrights. So we're all students there at the time. And and um, so I, you know, just started doing plays and and loved it and seemed to sort of I just had it just felt like oh this feels like home because of course I'd you know that's that's uh that was the world that I was in and, and I um decided to be an actor at about 12 and then so my mom left Yale and we moved back to New York and um uh, I was about 13 and and um I just you know called an actress friend and said what do I do and she said well here's my agent's phone number call them so my, my mother had not wanted to be a stage mother. Um, she made it very clear, like she didn't, like, if you want to do this, you got to do it on your own. And right. and the joys of New York is this, there's a lot of public transportation. So, um, and I'd have my 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 bus pass, you know, from, from school, because they give you bus passes so you get to school. Or I'd have my bike. So I would bike, I biked over to the east side and met this agent. And, and they said, uh, who was your representation before? Because I'd done some credits. I had some things. And I said, representation, what is that? I don't know what that is. <laughs> and um, and they said, do you sing? And I said, oh, yeah, I sing. And I, I've been in a boys choir, sang Boy Trouble. We 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 The choir was quite good. We, we were in Connecticut. And we went to Canterbury Cathedral and sang there. But I said, yeah, yeah, I I, I know. And so I broke into the tr Boy Trouble part of Handel's Messiah. And, and, oh, um, cool. <laughs> and they were like, this kid's a wild one. Um, and so they decided to sign me and start sending me out. And so that was how I sort of started working. But growing up in New York, the wonderful thing about being in New York was the uh, kind of autonomy that it gave me as a kid to be able to kind of really get out. I started studying. I started, you know, really just kind of, 
you know, if you're precocious and you're and you're driven as I was, um, I it was a way to uh, really have the world available to you, and, and it and um, and that was what was so fun about it. Well, you kind of dismayed a little, dismissed a little bit. Uh, you said you had done some stuff before. Well, the stuff you had done wasn't just little stuff. You did uh, plays like Lear, Hamlet, The Glass Menagerie, and more. I mean, those aren't just little shows. To... Yeah, no, right. I mean, I, 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 I mean, as I got older, I mean, I, and I did my first Broadway play at sixteen, um, and with Faye Dunaway, and then I, you know, oh gosh. I've done five now, uh, five row shows, and I, and I, you know, I, I've, I am. Tim, I'm I'm grateful every day for the career that I've had. I mean, being an actor is very tough, and and I am uh, very tough because there's just so so much inherent uh, rejection that comes with the territory, um, and and for every job that I get, there's you know a hundred or so that I didn't get, and and um, and and even those are good odds, you know. So so it's it's a thing where you know how do you you know how do you keep going, and and then how do you you know from when I was, you know, 13 to now where I am, you know, I go through, I've gotten through a lot of different changes in terms of like, you know, the parts that I'm right for. And so sometimes wonderful, wonderful actors aren't able to make that shift into that next, um, that next iteration of, of the kinds of parts that people are writing, you know? And so this really um, was, you know, I, I, I cork a fate. I don't know. I mean, I like I'm I'm grateful every day that that things have kind of been able to kind of roll out as they have. Well, since you were raised in theater, kind of, uh, does that feel more like home when more than the others? Because are you more comfortable in the theaters than the others? All right, at this point, I'm sure it doesn't matter, but I'm in the middle. Yeah, of the I, I probably originally that was the case. Now I'm, I'm at home in both. I'm actually going to be going back to do a play um, just for a week. Uh, there's a, there's an off Broadway play in New York called perfect crime. Um, it's been there for 37 years. Um, I think the woman who's in it has, I think in the Guinness book of world records, it's something like 13 or 14,000 performances that she's done. Oh, wow. but there's, a, there's a guy stepping out of, out for a week. And so I'm stepping in, I'm learning the, the parts, very big part, and then rehearsing for a week and then going to go do it in New York. I think the week of the 24th and um, of April. And I'm, so I'm learning the lines now and I, I'm excited to get back on stage. I mean, I haven't been on stage in a, in a bit. And so the idea of kind of being, you know, just an actor, you know, uh, oh my gosh. it feels, it feels, it's going to feel, um, I think it'll feel like home again, as you, as you say. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't see you not performing wonderful because everything you've done, I mean, you've made your own. You don't, I don't think any characters that you've played that I could say, well, that was kind of like so-and-so or other characters you played and which I think is phenomenal, phenomenal that you could do that. Thank you, Tim. Um, you start in a, Little film called Risky Business. I'm sure a few people have heard of it. I know I have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with Tom Cruise, I believe it was. Uh, what was that like making that movie? I mean, because you were, you looked like you were probably a teenager, older teen. I was. I literally, I got it when I was in, I was graduating high school. So I left, I graduated and went right to Chicago. I was 18. And, um, I'd never been in a big movie like that before. I mean, at, at the time it wasn't a, a huge movie, but it was a, it was a, there were a lot of teen kind of teen sex comedies at the time. And, and I was in a bunch of them and I was close on a whole bunch of other ones and, 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 and did more, but this was the biggest one, obviously that, that really kind of um, is a, is sort of a classic and obviously helped launch Tom Cruise. I mean, him jumping around in his underwear is a scene that we'll never forget. And, and, and he's, um, uh, you know, he's an astounding, astounding uh, thing that he's done in terms of obviously, you know, uh, continually just creating such watchable films that are so dynamic and so, so cool. Um, he's the he's the ultimate movie star. Right. Um, but there he was. Uh, you know, we were both about the same age at the time. And um, he had just done a movie called Taps. And uh, that's where he was friends with uh, Sean Penn. And and Sean would hang out in the set a whole bunch. We'd all kind of go out together, and we, you know, it was a it was a cool movie. I mean, I like I, you know, I. There, there, 
you know, at the 35th anniversary of the movie, I, I was talking to John Avnet, who's one of the producers on the film, and he he had said, you know, when they made it, their intent was to basically do something, sort of an update of The Graduate, you know, kind of a yeah. kind of make it, you know, and and if you think back on it, you know, when they, you know, in terms of that, those were the beginnings of the Reagan era, and and how we kind of pivoted and money and making money and and you know sometimes you just have to say what the f right all those things, yes. um, those things were all part of um, kind of the, sort of a shift that happened um, with you know as the eighties came in and and that sort of dynamic kind of became more central to how we sort of think about things. So that that movie kind of really sorry my 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 cord. Just got a, my battery's about to, I got to plug it. Okay. Um, uh, that, that's, you know, that kind of gave us kind of that, the movie kind of captures, I think, some of that pivot into kind of really being more focused on, you know, you know, what do you do and how do you make money? Right. Well, you brought up something that made me think you grew up with the, around the Brat Pot time. Um, yeah. They're, they're great actors, all of them. Um, but I'm kind of glad that, the ones like you, Andrew McCarthy, uh, Tom Cruise didn't really fall into that because most of the Brett Pack were 80s, maybe early 90s, and that was kind of it. You didn't hear Yeah, I mean Rob Lowe, Rob Lowe's done amazingly well and and God bless him. And and um and there's a few others, but you know, we, there's a funny thing where you know we were in New York, we were all New York actors, and so the Brat Pack were all in LA. And so in New York when you walked around New York, generally all of us would walk around wearing our backpacks. So we would call ourselves, we were the backpack. They were the brat pack. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I like that. I like that. But see, I don't really consider Rob Lowe. The ones I consider the brat pack are the breakfast club ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Jimmy Moore, uh, throwing Jimmy Moore in it because she was in several of those. But like Molly Ringwald and Michael, they're in everything together. Michael's you know, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. right they right. did a lot together. Whereas you all, you know, even Rob Lowe and uh uh Dylan and all of them, they did the outsiders, you know, yeah. and they did that without the members of the Brat Pack. It was what I consider the outsiders of the Brat Pack, which I enjoyed more. Yeah, yeah, I, I hear you. I hear you totally. I mean, I I um you know, again, that, that's the thing about can you make the transition, right? You know, that, that's another thing you don't realize when you start acting is that you you come in, you know, I worked a ton in my 20s. And then, you know, as I got into my late 20s and then early 30s, you know, things that were working in my early 20s, you know, in terms of just, you know, my, who I'm, you know, who I, you know, when you're, when you're working, basically who you are and, and how you perform is, you know, that's your... That's those are your crayons in your crayon box, right? So the question is, how do you how do you basically things that I did at 20 didn't work for me at 30. So I had to kind of you have to kind of start to kind of redefine who you are and figure out how to kind of make that transition. And that's been the case, you know. Um, and 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 you know, some people can make that turn and some people it's very hard. So so again, it's just another thing that I, I feel very grateful, very fortunate that um I've been able to uh you know stay in the game. Look, there again, you know. Uh- with the exception of Tom Cruise and maybe Rob Lowe, they uh, all the rest kind of did a couple of big movies and that was it. You and my friend have done Independence Day, Babes in Toyland, uh, Message in a Bottle, Pearl Harbor. I mean, these are all number one movies. I mean, it's incredible. Do you have a favorite role kind of that you enjoyed more than the others? You know, that's so hard. Um, there's so many. I know, it's kind of like picking that's your so, children. So, that's why I said yeah, more I, than not your favorite, just you enjoy it a little more. I mean, look, it's great to be in a big movie, right? I mean, it's fun to be in a big film. And, and um, you know, um, obviously, Independence Day gets lots of, you know, lots of notice every year. It gets rebroadcast. And, um, and, and I, you know, um, I, you know, I, I, I don't know that I have a favorite. You don't but, have to answer. But, I, but, I, but do, I, I will move on to this. And before I even say anything about it, I'm not going to ask you to and spill anything because there's not really a lot out there about it. You're fixing to be in a big show coming up called The Exorcist, which is a sequel. It's actually the, supposed to be the third and final chapter from the first two, the 1973 and the 77 movies. Right. So basically, um, 
it's the 50th anniversary. Uh, and so 73 to 2023. And, and, and basically what they have done is they've kind of, uh, oops, I'm sorry. They've reconceived. Uh, it's not a remake. Um, I mean, Ellen Burstyn is in this movie, um, which is pretty exciting because, I mean, she's 90 um, and they were able to bring her back. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's a wonderful cast, Ann Dowd and, and uh, uh, Leslie Odom Jr. and, and uh, Norbert Leo Butts and Jennifer Nettles, wonderful country music singer. And I love Jennifer. Wonderful actress. Um, anyway, so it, it's uh, and David Gordon Green is directing it. So he wrote it and directed it. He's he's most recently done all of the recent the last three Halloween movies. He's been very successful, very prolific and a really wonderful director. Anyway, it's going to be a big movie. Um, uh, Universal is producing it. It'll be out in October. Um, I was told October, of course, Friday the 13th, uh, but now I'm told it may come sooner. I, these are This is way above my pay grade, obviously, um, in terms of when that's going to come out, but um, it'll be soon. Um, and I, I know that, um, you know, there's uh, basically, <laughs> so, you know, so Warner Brothers owned The Exorcist, the IP, as it were. Universal, Universal Pictures, who wanted to make this, paid uh, uh, paid Warner Brothers $400 million for the right wow. to make it. And that's to make three movies. I'm in one. Um, and basically, um, you know, I think it's going to be a very loud opening just because I think they're probably going to want to, you know, promote not just one, but the other two, as well as also maybe get some of their money back. But it, it'll be in theaters and and I, I'm very excited about it. it it's uh, uh, the script was wonderful and, and it's a, uh, it's a great cast. And so we're I just uh, got to ask, what were you thinking when you took the pro that you took as a pasture? Don't you know, nothing ever ends up good for them in that exorcist, any of their movies, the priest, the pastors, nothing good comes out of that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You remember watching the first one the first time? Cause I oh. do, I was six years old and it, I won't watch it again. Oh, you were six. I was nine. You were at six. Oh wow, you were younger than I was. That's it. Was brutal. It was really hard. I for years I couldn't go in the dark and 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 I you know it was one of those like how did my mother actually take me to this movie so young? How did you see it at six? It was on TV. It came oh, on TV late night TV, and we had oh. gone out to eat and we're out late one night because right after that, dumb me because I'm a horror film and I I, I yeah. always have been. Hellhound came on after it, so you know. Come on. But yeah, that one really, there's never been a movie that I won't watch or rewatch. That one I, would, I won't. I just can't. I just can't. It traumatized me. I have a lot of friends have said to me recently, like, I'm so excited for your movie. I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> oh, I'll watch it because it's not part one. And I'm yeah. not six years old. You know? That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. Well, if you like horror movies, this is definitely one uh, one for you. And 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 you know, it's um just like the original. It, it it it's not. There's something about you know exorcisms that get 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 into your bones. You know, it's like smoke under the door. It's it's not you know, the classic Halloween Halloween movie. It's it's kind of more, it's creepier. So Anytime. so. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think that's what scared me the most, too, you know. And then, thank God, I didn't learn this till later on, you know, when I was older. But that was, the original was based on a true story, except yeah. as a boy that it, it happened to. Right. If I'd known that as a kid, I'd have really freaked him out. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to bring it up because it's going to it's gonna be a huge movie. And like I said, I'm a huge horror fan. I can't wait to see it. Can't wait. <laughs> it's going to be great. Me too. Yeah. Well, you had an incredible TV career, Streetcar Named Desire with Anne Margaret, Star Trek Voyager, Profiler, The Guardian, Once Upon a Time, and more. Do you remember your first television job? Um, yes, it was Sesame Street um, right. when, I was, when I was four and a half, so uh, basically five, I guess. Um, uh, I was living in New York in the Lower East Side, uh, and it was, one of the, it was one of the first years of Sesame Street, and they were looking for kids. And so I went down, my mom went down with me and, and basically I remember vividly, I think I did three of them. And, and my, my, I remember meeting Big Bird. I remember Oscar the Grouch and being just amazed by him. And then I remember also Bob sitting us, uh, Bob just died recently, um, yes. sitting us on the steps 
and he sang us a song. And then Mr. Hooper, who was a guy in the candy shop, he sat me on, they sat me on a donkey and we talked about the difference between horses and donkeys. My, my mom told me later that they apparently offered me a contract and, and, um, you know, she just didn't want to do it. She said, I don't want to be a stage mother. I don't want to sit around waiting for you. And she had a, she had a burgeoning career as a, as a costume designer. And that's, that's that whole thing. Like, if you're going to do this, you got to do it yourself. So, you know, uh, I, I waited, I waited six years and then, you know, seven years. And then at, you know, at the age of, of 12, I, <laughs> that's when I came to it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ventured out. Yeah. Well, I mean, early on you did several great shows. I mean, but, I will get us caught up on that one. Yeah, what was it like being part of the Star Trek universe? Uh, Star Trek was particularly exciting just because I was a Trekkie. Um, I mean, I had watched every episode of Star Trek at least two or three times. You too, right? Of course, yeah. And I had, <laughs> in addition to that, I had, um, you know, I had gone. Uh, I remember at ten going to a, a Star Trek convention. Um, my mom just kind of let me wander, in, you know. I don't know. Those days, p- parents were kind of not, not around very much. So I I remember just going to a this convention and walking around and and um and my uh I remember Gene Roddenberry uh, giving a speech at the time and and he talked about how one day you know you'll be able to turn on you know your TV and you'll be able to watch whatever you want whenever you want and I just thought that that was wild and amazing and I got his autograph which I still have which is fun. Oh, cool. Um, and then. Um, and, 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 you know, so it was very meaningful to kind of, you know, when I walked on the bridge the first time, it was like, wow, wow. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I, you know, putting on the uniform, you know, all, all those wonderful scenes with, with Neelix um, and, and, you know, I was corresponding with Seska and, you know, and, and LeVar Burton directed a few of the episodes. So that was exciting because I, I loved him going back to Roots. So, there were so many wonderful things about that that were just sort of magical and uh, really, really fun to be part of. Well, yeah, you had Captain Janeway and Seven of Nine on yours yeah. as well. Yeah. Jerry Ryan. Speaking of which, are you, you say you are a trackie. Are you still a trackie? What do you think of the new ones? I haven't, you know, I haven't, wa- I haven't watched it yet. Um, I mean, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I guess I... And I, I, I hear it's great, but I haven't watched it yet. And I, it's got, it, it basically sounds like a love letter to fans. Huh? There's three of them: uh, Discovery, uh, Picard, and Lower Picard Decks. is the one, the similar one, right? Picard yeah. Picard is, I, I can't even explain. I mean, it is phenomenal. It's, ah. it's incredible. I mean, it's more than what you would expect, especially this last season. That's I'm not going to ruin anything, but crazy. it's just because everybody's back. And I mean, I'm not going to ruin anything because. Yeah, that's in the yeah. but yeah. then everybody's back. Yeah, and yeah, it's it's awesome. I, I love the Star Treks and Star Wars. I do like some of them too. Yeah, um, one of my top shows couldn't uh, was Once Upon a Time. You were Doctor Archie Harper, better known as Jiminy Cricket. That had to be so much fun. I love that show. I so I so love that show. <clears throat> Yeah, it was it was really a, a, a magical experience. It was kind of a lightning in a bottle thing, you know. We, you know, I read the script the first time, and I and I thought this is amazing, but they're never going to be able to pull this off. It's so complex. I mean, it's so it's so there's so much going on here, and um, and I remember the first time that we um, that they screened it for us. It's for you know for all the you know, the regular cast, they, they, the producers, Adam and Eddie, uh, who were the writer, executive producers, and and they, you know, the lights came down and we were all like, oh my God, we're just sort of knocked out. And this is before we knew for sure that we were picked up. I'm sure they had been whispered in their ears, but um, that we were, but, but this was um, uh, something just came together, uh, particularly those first couple of seasons, first two Two seasons were, uh, you know, those are my personal favorites. But I mean, the show went on for seven years, which is, of course, a remarkable thing. And and and, and there's everything about, you know, it from a production point of view. I mean, the costumes were incredible. Eduardo Castro is brilliant. The production design was fabulous. The way it was shot, the visual effects, and the writing. I mean, it's the writing, the writing, the writing is what made it so um, delicious, you know. And so. Uh, uh, well, as you said, there was so much going on, and as a fan, 
every, at the end of every season, I'm thinking, this has got to be it. What more? What else can they do? And it's like, oh my god, oh my god, something even more fabulous than that last. You know, it's just 100%, like 100. percent It was really some nonstop action, and and I and so many great actors. I mean, I just so many great actors. I mean, Ginny and and uh, and Lana and um, Jennifer and then Josh. Uh, you know, there's just so many great incredible people and then all the kind of the people that came through just astounding actors so i i uh it was a great experience and and it and it's a it's you know interestingly unlike a lot of american content which doesn't necessarily always um uh the term is that it doesn't travel meaning it doesn't you know american content american humor doesn't play as well in france or in germany or you know in japan and 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 this show has an enormous international audience and and you know I, I get tweets and and requests for cameos and everything from from everywhere um uh and, and it's it's uh it, it's incredible it's sort of incredible what um you know what they were able to do again i i believe it's the writing it's because they took from these myths and stories and 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 things that were so uh i i think you know that that crossed that went across so many different cultures and and really spoke across you know beyond language lines that really spoke to core issues. So that it was a it was a um, absolutely amazing, remarkable experience to be a part of that. Well, not to mention that they were able to y'all you all were able to show us more about our favorite childhood characters that we never knew. I mean, because it went deep in a lot of the storylines that we never knew. Right. I mean, that, that was the sort of the genius construction of this is that you take characters that you think you, you already sort of know, like, you know, you know, the evil queen or, you know, you know, um, uh, Jiminy Cricket or Geppetto or whoever. And, and then you basically put them all together and then you have kind of your memory of them, but then suddenly you're introduced this whole new side of them. And, and, and again, what was interesting is that men and women and, and huge gaps, I mean, Grandma loved it. And then, you know, the parents loved it. And then, you know, the 20 year olds and then the teenagers loved it. And then the kids loved it. And it, and it had, because it, it seemed to appeal to such a wide audience. People would say our whole family gathers together and watches it every Sunday. Cause we would, you know, we would air on Sundays, um, Sunday night on, on, you know, on, on ABC, which is, you know, Disney. And, and it was, a uh, it, it seemed to be, in the very fractionalized universe where we all kind of huddle at our own device, watching our own particular show, this seemed to be kind of like a, a place that everyone could agree and everyone gathered around. And again, it's part of what made it so remarkable. Well, funny you say that because uh, I, I lived with, I lived with my mother to help take care of her for, well, that was show was going on and she would watch TV shows in the living room, her shows, and I would watch my shows in the bedroom. Not that one. We always watch that one together. We always watch that one together. That's that's why one of the reasons I do love the show. I mean, mom passed away seven years ago, but I love that. I love that that memory. That's sweet. That's really sweet. And 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 what happened in your family? It seems to have happened in many others. And and again, that was that was uh, I lay that completely at Eddie Eddie and Adams. Uh, you know, the writers. Um, their their vision and then their ability to sort of follow through this idea of just keeping us, you know, so poised for what's going to happen next. And just as you think you're going to get the answer, then some other new thing happens. You're like, Oh my God, how am I going to wait till next week to see what happens? You know? And then I've met yes. so many people who have said, I'm on my fifth now, cause it's on Disney plus I'm on my fifth watch through the whole series, <laughs> you know, from beginning to end. So it, it's a, uh, it's been quite the, it's been quite the journey. Once upon a time is in my thing. Uh, next month to start over because that's what I'm doing now. I mean, I'm watching the current one shows that are on TV, what I do watch, and then I'm rewatching some of the, the runaway shows and some of the older shows that I've seen. I gotta ask you a question if you don't know or if you don't want to answer. I was I don't know why it popped up the other day in my on TikTok, I think it was about Jennifer Goodwin. It's funny, it was funny. Have you ever seen her run? I don't remember seeing her run on the show. They were like the producers the, the, or the directors did not like the way she ran. So the only time you had her filmed running was when she had a speaking part. And the other time it was a uh, stand-in because they said she couldn't run. Right. 
Well, I mean, I know she was pregnant with two babies um, during that the time. That may be what it was. Like um, I said, it was TikTok, you know, so it was just a very short. Well, I, have, I, just, I don't I don't recall that at all. Um, <laughs> well, what uh, they did is they were showing like a picture of three, all four of them running, Jennifer, Jennifer, and a couple others. And then they cut away and they cut back. Then you wouldn't see Jennifer Goodwin running with them. Then they cut away and cut back. And there she was again because she had a speaking part. Then they cut, and it was just kind of a comedy thing they were doing. It, it well, was funny, but I was just like, wow, here I'm fixing to have you on the show. And that pops up. It's just crazy. That's funny. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know about that. I was. I wasn't there those days when they were shooting that. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to ask you a favorite storyline because there's some. Uh, you should. I can't even pick my favorite storyline. So there's no way that I would expect you to. <laughs> uh, do you think it could have gone longer? I wished it had gone longer, but I don't. I don't know if it could have gone any further because, like I said, at the end of every season, as a fan, it was like. Where are they going to go next? You know, and yeah, I mean, you know, what was that basically when actors sign on to series, they sign on for six years, and um, and that's what we went six years, and then um, uh, you know, actors then at some point sort of say, you know, look, I- I've done this part, I love this show, um, I've had a great run, I want to do something else, and and I and you know, I think the ratings were solid but they were probably not as sort of vibrant as they were when we when, you know the first four years or so so it wasn't doing badly but it's just that the show had been around now and it wasn't it wasn't the new kid on the block as it were so what happened was i think you know several of the kind of the main actors who were associated with the show said we want to go do something else i know jennifer um uh i mean jenny you know wanted to go be a mom and then josh obviously wanted to look for other stuff and then he got that other incredible show on netflix and and um um, and then basically I, I know that, um, uh, the, the other Jennifer basically wanted to direct and she was sort of exploring that. So there, I think people had other ideas. So the last season, season seven was really the, the few actors who were going to stay. Um, they sort of re, as you can see, it was sort of a reboot of a lot of what was there and, and with a, a vision for, um, kind of, a. Um, you know, perhaps a, you know, just another another direction. I mean, I, could it have gone on? Yes, but I think the actors ultimately are sort of what decide what are the deciding the deciding factor. Well, you said that about well, I say typecasting, and it may not be the pro- proper wording, but you were guest starred on a show that is synonymous for that, and it's Grey's Anatomy. Um, a lot right. of their people, like uh, Ellen Pompeo, just left this year because she's just like, you know, I've been in this role for 18 years. Right. Uh, like, surely there's something else. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Sandra O oh left and said she wouldn't come back unless it was like a final finale for the show because she didn't want to be known. She was being known as her character instead of and, and several other actors from that show. When you said that, that's what came to my mind was Grey's Anatomy. It was throughout the years. Yeah. Like 20 yeah. years. I mean, it's wonderful because, I mean, obviously, you know, there's an opportunity to sort of both get, in this case, you know, like Ellen, I'm sure, will never have to work a day in her life. And and she's, you know, financially set and she could make any decision she wants. She could throw herself into, you know, uh, charity work or she could, you know, build a hospital or she could, you know, do plays for the rest of her life or whatever it is that she wants to do. She's basically kind of in a place where she could decide creatively from where she is, she could go anywhere. But after 18 years, it's like, how, I, is there more? Is there, you know, that's 24 episodes times 18. That's that's a lot of shows. Um, Me and my best friend, um, Heather, uh, have watched this show since the beginning. And we we're huge, huge fans of it. But the last five or six years, we're just kind of like, really? Come on, guys. I love the show, but it's kind of taken its course. You know, it's... Oh, it's renewed again. Okay. But um, she is still doing the voiceover, though. Ellen is on the show. You know how they have that speaking voiceover? She still does that for, she'll continue to do that on the show. Yeah. Something that most people don't know, I didn't actually realize it, and I should have. You're a soap star as well. You well, right. I, I did, I did, I did several episodes. I mean, I, I, I you know, it's fun to do basically. Um, you know, at the time they were looking for actors who were working, uh, on, you know, on so-called nighttime stuff. And I, you know, I sort of thought it would be fun and interesting. So I did, 
I did I did a bunch of episodes and and I have to say I have so much respect for soap actors. Um, I was ask about that. What you so thought of the pace? Hard. I mean, you get you get you know thirty five pages you have to memorize you know the night before, and you walk on and you have one rehearsal, and you and you're and you're in, like yeah. go. And there's no second take, and you do it, and you basically as long as nothing crashes or breaks or scenery doesn't fall down, they film it and they move on. And so you come in and you're like, you know, you know, let's let's go. And so. You know, actors have done it for years and years and years. I mean, they've developed that muscle so that they can actually kind of really find a way to, um, n- you know, navigate the the just the pressure, the the line pressure. But um, you know, as I got a little bit more used to it, I kind of really enjoyed it, and then it just started to feel kind of um, fun, you know. But at least initially, it was whoa, this is a lot. <laughs> Now I, I brought this up because it was curious. I was curious, but also because I do a lot of soap stars on the, oh, on you the do. show. Oh, very good. Yeah. And and no offense to primetime people, it's kind of like you would think that they would start people on daytime. Because if you can make it, like you said, those pages and how fast paces and everything, if you can make that, you could do primetime because it's a little bit slower pace and a little bit less memory each day. Right. Uh, totally. Totally. But, I mean, it's a uh, it, it's just a lot it's just a lot and 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 um um i think you know for me starting in the theater with everything that i've done is um you know been the best training people say like what do i do i want to be an actor so i said go do plays work on theater work in theater get your legs under you and and that's why i'm going back and doing this play right because i i've been i've been directing i've been you know producing i've been doing other things um in front of the camera behind and and i'm really I wanted to just go be an actor and, and I can tell you it's a, it's a very big part and I'm, and I'm learning the lines and it's like, Whoa, I haven't used this muscle um, where, you know, for a while where you've got a 30 page scene and you just don't stop talking. And it's like getting those lines in my head. It's, it's okay. This is uh it's taking a little bit more time than it used to. And, and I'm excited to get back to it. I wish I lived up there close to New York. Cause I would love to go see some yours and others. I, I don't think I've ever been to Broadway. On Broadway or off Broadway shows, high school is about it. Uh, um, you're also a voice actor. You've done voices in several Star Wars games, such as Star Wars Rogue Squadron, Force Commander, Knights of the Old Republic, Republic Command. You've done, I think it was some Marvel, maybe it may have been DC. Uh, do you enjoy doing the voices? Yeah, I mean, the biggest, probably the biggest game is uh, Mass Effect um, and then Knights of the Old Republic. Um, I'm not a gamer, so I can't speak. Yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. I, I mean, I, those are um, uh, huge, giant, giant games, um, and, and I'm um, I am astounded by the the community um, and the uh, and the the love uh, and the caring and the connectedness that people in Mass Effect have for one another. We did Mass Effect one, two, and three. It was voted, you know, New York Times Game of the Year. And it has, you know, like Once Upon a Time, just a massive, massive worldwide following. And, you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, there, there are so many great actors in this piece, but the but the company BioWare is the one that created it. And it is, um, well, this is what I've been told. And I'm not a big gamer either, but this is what I've been told. And I'm just repeating basically is that Mass Effect to movies is like the way star wars was um you know where there was all the movies up until star wars and then that movie changed everything and it was the sort of the pivot point where things kind of moved in an entirely different direction prior to that you know there were a lot of shooter games and a lot of kind of running and gunning kind of things and this this is a really this is a relationship based game and and but it's very high adrenaline and you can have relationships with characters you can have intimate relationships with characters you can have um, uh, all sorts of kind of uh, uh, it level deep levels of engagement and 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 anyone who knows the game knows that it's not just a game because um, I've seen so many tattoos relative to the game. Um, is that it's really a life experience. It's not just a game. It's really sort of a, a profound, uh, it's a profound place uh, that people go. 
Well, I don't know about the game in particular you're talking about, but maybe it could be like some of the others and be made into movies. I mean, you've got Assassin's Creed, Call of Duty, Halo. They were all games first. Right, right, right. I mean, I, I you know, obviously each game has its own, has its own, um, you know, kind of community. Um, there's, you know, we know that the gaming world is uh, bigger than, you know, than any other part of the entertainment industry at this point, um, you know, by a, uh, a factor of probably 10. Um, and it's a, or more, I don't know, it, it, the gaming world is huge and, and the appetite and the, you know, kind of a connection to the characters in the games, as well as also then the, uh, you know, the stories and, and the landscapes, they're just astounding. So, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, Mass Effect, also Knights of the Old Republic are are both sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, classics and and, and um, they they kind of re, uh, remastered and brought, uh, you know, Mass Effect during the pandemic uh, back in 4K and, and there have been some others uh, as well. So anyway, it, it's a it's a cool it's a cool thing that it's a wonderful community to be part of. Uh, I hear it is. I, I've gone to some fundraising where they're gaming for for, for our con, our nonprofit once. Uh, he did thirty six hours. Wow, thirty six hours in January to raise money, and he raised two thousand dollars for us. I mean, just doing that. Wow, that's people incredible. Donate because so many people are watching hours. him and donate. That's well, crazy. what he did, he said, I'm starting out with twenty four hours. For every, uh, I think it was every 500 or 300, I can't remember what it was, he would add on 30 minutes. So everybody, when he reached to almost the end of his time, somebody would throw in more money and put him another 30 minutes on. Finally, well, they were going to do it again, but I was just like, no, you, you got to stop. Because he was he was not making a lot of sense when he talked at that point, because he was talking to people and playing the game. For 36 hours so wow that's 36 hours oh my god it's how much how much caffeine did he ingest to do that i can't even imagine i mean i didn't watch it all because i get dizzy watching it but i did come in like before i'd go to bed i came in when i get up in the morning I'd come back on and you know and he was still going strong it's crazy it yeah was crazy. that's wild that's wild it's like that's more than jerry lewis telephone right <laughs> <laughs> i know well you're not only an actor you also, you're an award-winning director, writer, and producer. You've won multiple awards for, for one, The Bird Who Could Fly. What was that experience like when those awards? It had to be phenomenal. I mean. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, uh, somewhere. That's about, just one movie with awards. I didn't, I, you got several, several, several. <laughs> yeah, I mean, somewhere uh, back oh, about 12 <laughs> 13 years ago, basically, I was producing a film with Ed Bigley Jr. and and I, the director fell out and I sort of fell in and I was trying to sort of uh, find my way uh, behind the camera. And it's a lot to learn, a lot to figure out, a lot to kind of uh, understand how you tell, how us tell a story visually and not use, you know, words to do it and, and, and what that process is. And, and basically what we did was we, um, uh, we finished the series it won a bunch of awards and, and I was like, Oh, I kind of like this. And, and, you know, as an actor, invariably there's time when you have time off and, and you're, or, you know, where you want to sort of find, you know, other ways to kind of other ways to storytell, you know? Um, and this became kind of a, um, uh, uh sort of a new sandbox and there's so much that I've had to learn and so much that I've, I've put together in terms of, um, you know, opportunities, different opportunities, different ways to do this. And, and I, and I'm, I'm, um, I love doing it. You know, I love doing it. I mean, I, I, I'm aware of the fact is that, you know, the stuff that I've been doing is, is, um, uh, more in the documentary vein lately. Um, uh, the bird of the fly was narrative meaning scripted and, and, uh, a, a wonderful film. I'd love to work with more actors, but at the moment I've been doing docs and, and, uh, um, in, in either case there, there are opportunities to be able to tell stories, you know, uh, just like I do as an actor. Um, it's just with a, in a different way. And, and I love, I love that most, all of your docuseries or shows are based on such serious subjects. Uh, like even on, on, on Begler Street, it, it was, it was a fun show, but it also incorporated green energy. Right. Um, right. You know, only in theaters it had to do with 
uh, the different times that the theaters have almost lost out and came back. Uh, and the one that you're at, I got out now, 10 Days in Watts, you know, the resilience of Watts, the urban gardens and they're for a, you bring a, it's a cause is what I like to call it. And you yeah. bring attention to that. Yeah. I mean, I, somehow, I guess I have uh, what, uh, you know, my, my, my passion to try and want to illuminate social issues and, or to kind of do things that have sort of social relevance or, you know, or, or speak to un, un, unheard voices or underserved communities, you know, that's um, to me, it's so hard to make any movie. And, and to me, having that connection has been uh, an important thing to kind of hold on to and to kind of give me a sense of um, um drive to get it done you know because uh it's a it's a lot to make any movie it always is and and this is a uh th that's where my heart gets engaged well i've not got the opportunity to see only in theaters i i want to i know it's in select theaters right now there's certain ones uh which you can find out on your website which is in the description of these videos so is all of your social media contact um but only in theaters from what i could gather can you tell us a little about it? Because I don't want to mess it up if I didn't see it correctly. Yeah, yeah. So Only in Theaters is basically a documentary about a, it's about a family business. Um, the family business, uh, it's a three, four generation family business, which is a very American story. However, in this case, this family business happens to be Hollywood and movie theaters. Uh, there's been, the, the family that we follow is uh, is the Lemley family, an immigrant family who escaped, uh, you know, Germany um, and, and came to America and, and essentially have dedicated themselves to the art of filmmaking and, and, you know, filmmakers who make them and the audiences who love them for almost a century. But Carl Lemley, the original Lemley, um, started a little movie theater, um, sorry, a little movie studio called Universal Pictures and made oh, 800 wow. movies and, you know, Phantom of the Opera and Hunchback Notre Dame and, 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 and on and on and on. So it's an amazing family, but it's an opportunity to tell a story about a family business and the family business's challenges and what they're up against. And, and, and we backed into kind of a larger conversation about the future of movie theaters. Um, they were already feeling pressure before the pandemic. Uh, but now after the pandemic, it's been, um, it's been, you know, it's been a challenge for a lot of them to hold on. So it, it we had a lot of wonderful filmmakers talk to us, including um, Ava DuVernay and Cameron Crowe and, James Ivory and and Leonard Moulton, not a, a film critic, and and um, uh, and then Allison Anders and Nicole Hollis Center, wonderful filmmakers who were inspired by the Lumley theaters or theaters like them. That essentially these art house cinemas are so important for the art form. Um, so we all love going to see big movies like Avatar, but it's the smaller movies, um, the more movies that maybe are well. You know, movies without people in 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 costumes as uh, superheroes. Um, I, you know, th those are the kind of the uh, uh, that's the audience we're speaking to. So it it is, as I say, a family business and a family business uh, set in Hollywood. Well, I kind of brought that movie up uh, not only because it's, it's going to be fabulous for me to see it, but uh, also uh, because the context. You know, with the pandemic, as you brought up, do you think? we're going to, we're starting to see the end of theaters, you know, because like the pandemic and now everything's going online. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, the, the, um, there's a lot competing with theaters um, at the end of the day, you know, I think what we have, you know, the, some of the most successful movies of all times have been in the last two years, um, including Spider-Man and Top Gun and, Avatar and and so clearly there's an appetite to go to movies. The question is whether or not they'll go to smaller movies. So that's what we are sort of exploring, and that's what we're hoping is that people sort of get back into the habit of going to movie theaters. Because when you go to a movie theater, it's an experience. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just getting the content. I mean, you're in a theater with other people where the emotional experience is amplified, whether it to be scary or sad or funny um you know you you feel it in a different way films have been made the art form has was designed to be on a 40 or 60 foot screen so that we are in a space that is real estate dedicated to the experience of the movie where you get taken away that's why when you go to a movie you can sort of feel like you've you know had a mental vacation because you like you you're like oh i went away for the weekend you know because you feel um like you've been carried away um, that happens in a movie theater where there's no interruptions, no dings, no buzzes, no whirs, no 
no one at the door, no dog or a kid that needs attention. And, and it is a it is a dedicated experience. And that's again what the art form was conceived to be to be had that way. Um and um so every filmmaker I know is 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 hoping and, and really um uh determined to try and keep movie theaters uh there for for you know for the art form and, and for the audiences because it we forget, you know, if you haven't been to a movie theater in a while, you forget how much more powerful the experience is when you see it there. I, I reluctantly admit I haven't been to the theater in a couple, few years. Um, and it's kind of weird because our movie theater here just rebuilt and now they have recliners and they sell wine and beer. It's like, wow, I've never heard of that in a theater. But you're right, the memories of theaters. Um, my first movie I, that I ever went to was Star Wars, the original, with my mom. And, and I was seven. I was young. And I can I remember it. I mean, it's just one of those vivid memories, a great memory with my mom. And it's memories like that that we that you develop. Right. I mean, I think about, you know, when you think about the films that you saw that were impactful. Do you do you remember those films that you watched on streaming uh, where you were on your couch? Generally, you know, those great movies, you remember where you saw it when you saw it, where I saw The Godfather, where I saw Close Encounters, where I saw Gandhi, you know, where I saw, you know, Superman the first time. I mean, these are these are these are indelibly ex indelible experiences that are sort of captured at in that space. And so the movie's called Only in Theaters. Um, and it is uh, it, it is really a love letter to going to the movies. Well, I know you could catch um, your Watts show. On PBS. Right. PBS.org, or you can go even on YouTube, I think at this point, um, you can uh, put 10 Days in Watts, and I think the four episodes are there. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a story about a neighborhood, and it's a very uplifting story about a very underserved neighborhood, but a farm uh, opens up in this, in this, uh, in this, you know, again, underserved and, and economically challenged neighborhood. And, uh, it's a story about the neighborhood, a portrait of Watts and, and the wonderful people who live there. Will we be able to get um, only in theaters on the same platform when it gets done in the theaters? Because I know right now. Yeah, it's, well, only theaters theaters. Be, it's, in, it's in theaters now around the country. Um, uh, we've been like in 80 cities and um, we are going to be. Uh, there's a streaming. It will be coming out and streaming in the next month or so. Um, basically, if you can. If people can reach, you know, go to the website onlyintheaters.com, um, or you can find us on Facebook. We update that a lot. Um, that gives that will give you a whole bunch of um, uh, updated information about when Only in Theaters hit streaming because it will ultimately be on streaming. Um, I know it'll reach an, a wider audience that way. Um, but I made a movie called I, I, I couldn't make a movie called Only in Theaters and have it play only on streaming. Um, <laughs> it had true. to be. Um, it had to be have a theatrical run. So that's what we've done. Um, Definitely also have a DVD that's coming out in July and and all that. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I you took me down a rabbit hole. Um, the uh, Begley's. I would have finished watching that today, but I couldn't because I had to do this show. But I'll finish it later on because I really got hooked on that. And then only in theaters. I mean, I, I remember when that first came out because I've been following you on social media and I've been wanting to see that since you first, since it first released. I was like, oh, select theaters, it's never here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's coming. It's coming for sure. Well, I, I can't wait to see it. Um, I, I love shows like that. that uh, I just love them. So how did you survive through the pandemic? I mean, because that had a huge impact on everybody. Um, yeah, we, you know, we all did our best. Um, you know, I, I, uh, went for long walks in Central Park and, and, uh, you know, tried to fight off the madness, you know, it was really an exercise in trying to, to sort of stay, stay, uh, keep my feet under me, you know, so that kind of thing. It was a crazy time. That's one of those subjects that like, you know, unfortunately, 9-11, you, you assess, you know, where were you on 9-11? Most people can tell you where they were, you know, it's those impactful things that, that really stand out. You betcha. you betcha forever and ever. It's going to be that it's going to be that the defining factor. Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah. Raphael, I appreciate you being here, giving us your time. Uh, Thank I've you so too. enjoyed this. So enjoyed Thank this. You. Thank you. Thank I, you. I hope you'll come back. Maybe we can get you if I can get the others, some of the others from um, 
dance with us or maybe once upon a time we could do a group reunion yeah yeah sure sounds great sounds great i would love to i know you're busy so yeah it's been, it's been, a, it's been a crazy a crazy few months but i but it's uh it, it's starting to calm down and, and i'm um, catching up here so yeah yeah it's calms down just long enough for you to take off again <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for your time, Raphael. Thank you. So appreciate it. Yeah. You take, take care. care. All right. Bye now. Bye. I'd like to thank Raphael Spars for being here today. I would like to thank the Necrotizing Fasciitis Foundation for sponsoring our show. For more information on necrotizing fasciitis, please visit www.necfasc.org. N-E-C-F-A-S-C.org. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for more upcoming episodes. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button. It'll help us out a lot. And as always, remember.